Thank you all for being here today. It's really a pleasure to address you and to be with you, uh, to worship with you at the new mass, at least for those of you who were there. Um, this is my second trip to Detroit, but my first visit to Assumption Broadway, uh, which of course uh, is a place I've known about for many, many years. So thank you for the invitation. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, at an event called the Republican National Convention, a religious sister named Deirdre Byrne gave a rousing pro-life speech that concluded with a promise of prayers for then-President Trump. You'll find us here with our weapon of choice, the rosary. The liberal Franciscan theologian Father Daniel P. Moran reacted with what a celebrity blogger would call a spittle-flecked nutty. <laughs> Weapons are, by definition, instruments of violence. Prayer is not a weapon. Sacramentals for prayer like groceries are not weapons. Christ preached and lived a message of non-violence, and prayer is always about love, God's love. Weaponizing faith is disgusting and idolatrous. Here, Dee Dee and Daniel offer us a perfect contrast. You might even call them Sister Rambo and Brother Bambi. <laughs> Which one has the right perspective on Christianity? It seems pretty clear, whatever else may be the case, that Father Daniel hasn't recently cracked open the letters of St. Paul. For he might have stumbled across some verses in 2 Corinthians that could have put ideas in Sister Deirdre's head. Quote, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, with, with the, the weapons, weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. That's from chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians. And again from chapter 10, the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. One is reminded of how Pope Francis said this past epiphany that faith is not a suit of armor, seeming to forget that St. Paul in Ephesians tells Christians to take up the full armor of God and to use the shield of faith. One would think scriptural literacy is a job requirement for the papacy, but I guess there are exceptions to every rule. The life of man on earth is a warfare. That is Job 7.1. These words from the book of Job express a fundamental truth of the Christian life. We are born into enemy territory. The world is in the grip of the evil one, to whom our first parents gave the keys to the city. Scripture really leaves no doubt about it. The Apostle John writes, We know that whosoever is born of God does not sin, but the generation of God preserves him, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. In the Vulgate, mundus totus in maligno positus est. Within this world, Christ has established a fortress, a beachhead, a kingdom, that is at the same time not of this world, but of the enduring world of heaven, where the evil one has already decisively lost. The fury with which he campaigns on earth is an expression of his despair at having been driven forth from heaven into hell. Either from malice or from ignorance and foolishness, many men end up enlisting in Satan's army, and we are engaged with them in a struggle not only to repel their attacks, attacks, but to capture them, if possible, and bring them over to our side. The life of man is a battle in another and more distressing way. We have enemies within us, too, that we can never fully escape from. Disordered concupiscence, bad habits, the memories of our past sins, although we can bring these into subjection. That, indeed, is what the season of Lent is supposed to help us to do. To paraphrase St. Benedict, our whole life should be salted with a Lenten spirit. But the Church wisely asks us to set apart a segment of time each year 
when we can hit the spiritual restart button. We are not alone in this fight. We have many allies, many powerful friends. The most powerful weapons in our arsenal are the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and the other sacraments, the Divine Office and the sacramentals, especially the Rosary, which Christ and the Church provide for our sanctification, the strengthening of the inner man, the conquest of enemy territory within and without. These things are not just individual actions we perform, they are acts of the mystical body that carry the full weight of its indestructible essence. I came across a stirring passage in a book by an obscure French author, an old school Jesuit writing before the council, by the name of Taimon de Epernon. He says, quote, This then is the reason why God in his love has stooped so low to us. It is in a material universe that our destiny is shaped and shattered and remade. The material world is a vast plain of battle, scarred with the marks of our defeat, or resplendent with the trophies of victory. Matter is man's strength and his weakness, for it is by his life amid material things and by his use of them that man rises above himself, and on the other hand, it is the material part of our nature that bleeds and is broken in the press of life. It was divinely fitting that God should come and apply his saving omnipotence to this essential part of his creation, the most vulnerable of all. He does this by the sacraments. They not only are signs of his coming, they actually contain the divine healing power and apply it to our souls. In them, Matter is elevated to, a rank, to the rank of a bond between God and man, and a symbol of the infinite mystery of God's love. Raised to sacramental dignity, matter is not only the channel by which the thought and prayer of the creature rise to the uncreated, but the channel by which God himself really comes to his creatures to dwell in them forever. Et mansionem apud eum faciemus and we will make our abode with him." Unquote. Without this help from God throughout our lives, above all in the Most Holy Eucharist, the vast plain of battle will be scarred with the marks of our defeat, rather than resplendent with the trophies of victory. By God's grace, given, given to us under material forms, even as the Son of God was given to us in the man Jesus of Nazareth, we can find healing, rise above ourselves, and join Christ, our victorious King. Father Christopher Smith has these rousing words for us. Quote, As Christians, we know that peace comes from the social reign of Christ as King over all peoples. And to establish that peace, we engage, first of all, in a spiritual battle within ourselves. We absolutely must not be afraid to declare total war on the world, the flesh, and the devil, which seek to carry our souls away from peace, away from the Prince of Peace. But that spiritual battle also means that we must learn how to defend our faith and engage others for our freedom to practice what we know is the true religion. Now, of course, every age has its own particular fight for right. The spiritual battle takes on a different quality in different times and places, but there is a very particular quality to what that looks like today." Unquote. Part of this very particular quality is surely fighting for the Church's traditional rites of divine worship, which candidly acknowledge and boldly assist us in the spiritual battle we are facing. In my talk today, I want to show some of the many ways that the traditional Roman liturgy recognizes, with realism and supernatural hope, the true state of affairs in which we are involved. Roberto de Mattei notes that the Church is the mystical body of Christ, a reality that transcends history, but in history lives and battles, and hence is called the Church militant. The Church here on earth is not simply on the pilgrim's way, which is sort of a home, homely metaphor, but is also a militant church, Ecclesia Militans. Her ranks are called to battle. First, 
let's look at the traditional liturgical calendar. Every year, Holy Mother Church reminds us again and again of battles fought by Christians to preserve the true faith on earth. For the kingdom of God is not far removed from us in a heaven that cannot be reached, but is a reality present also on earth, albeit in the form of sacramental signs administered and received by imperfect men, and in the form of a hierarchical social body that coexists with the cities and nations of men. Wherever Christ is present, his kingdom is present. We are living at the fringes of his realm with access to the king himself. We do not pray, thy kingdom stay away, but thy kingdom come. We do not pray, thy will be done only in heaven, and as for earth, forget about it. It's a hopeless disaster. We pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven or actually more literally, as in heaven, so also on earth. In our Lord's parable of the mustard seed, we should not overlook the fact that a seed must be planted in the earth, where it germinates and puts down its roots in order to grow into the heavens. Christians are called first and foremost to beg the Lord for deliverance, but we are also called to make a good use of the natural gifts and abilities he has given us for living with dignity here below. That is the reason why, when the blossoming of the human divine civilization known as Christendom was attacked by its enemies, Christians reasonably and rightfully took up arms to defend themselves, their families and peoples, their holy religion. We may find ourselves in the future needing our weapons to defend the most fundamental human and Christian rights against totalitarian progressivism in the state and modernism in the church. None of us can know exactly what this will look like, but it is important to see that we are not wrong to be thinking along these lines of defense. The traditional Roman martyrology, which is read as part of the Office of Prime, puts us in mind of this fact over and over again. Some examples. On the 12th of September, we read about the feast of the most holy name of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which Pope Innocent XI commanded should be celebrated by reason of the famous victory obtained over the Turks at Vienna in Austria by the help of the Blessed Virgin. And on the 16th of the same month, at Monte Cassino, Blessed Pope Victor III, who shed a fresh luster on the Apostolic See and with God's help gained a famous victory over the Saracens. On May 1st, we hear of St. Pius V that he battled against the enemies of the Christian name. On October 7th, we hear of the Feast of the Blessed Virgin Mary of the Rosary and the commemoration of St. Mary of Victory, which Pope St. Pius V instituted to be kept yearly in memory of the glorious victory obtained on this same day in a naval battle by the Christians against the Turks. That, of course, is Lepanto, 1571, by the help of the same Mother of God. And in fact, it was a second victory over the Turks in Hungary in 1716 that prompted Pope Clement XI to extend the Feast of the Most Holy Rosary to the entire Catholic world. Can you imagine what these popes I've mentioned would think about Abu Dhabi and Fratelli Tutti? In his 1937 encyclical on the Rosary, In Gravascentibus Malis, Pope Pius XI expressly recalled Lepanto, quote, when the impious Mohammedan power, that's, that's what you got in papal encyclicals in 1937, when the impious Mohammedan power, trusting in its powerful fleet and war-hardened armies, threatened the peoples of Europe with ruin and slavery, then, upon the suggestion of the sovereign pontiff, the protection of the Heavenly Mother was fervently implored, and the enemy was defeated and his ships sunk. Thus the faithful of every age, both in public misfortune and in private need, turn in supplication to Mary the benignant, so that she may come to their aid and grant help and remedy against sorrows of body and soul. And never was her most powerful aid hoped for in vain by those who besought it with pious and trustful prayer." Unquote. On October 23rd, 
in the martyrology. We read about the birthday of St. John of Capistrano, priest of the Order of Friars Minor, confessor, a man illustrious for holiness of life and zeal for the spreading of the Catholic faith. He, by his prayers and miracles, delivered from siege the town of Tornau, which was wasted by a powerful Turkish army. In the entry for St. Stephen, King of Hungary, confessor, who was adorned with divine virtues, we learn that his feast is especially kept by decision of Pope Innocent XI on September 2nd, on which day the strong fortress of Buda, by the aid of the Holy King, was valiantly recovered by the Christian army. The traditional martyrology mentions over 360 martyrs to Islam on over 30 separate dates in the year, with no month skipped. The Church does not want us to forget the memory of these heroes of the faith who surrendered their lives for the love of Christ and the love of his truth. They were not combatants, but neither were they milquetoast Christians who apologized for offending people with the gospel or who preached human fraternity and boundless tolerance of error. One of my favorite entries in this regard, in the Martyrology, appears on February 21st. At Damascus, St. Peter Mavimenus, who said to certain Arabs who came to him, every man who does not embrace the Catholic Christian faith is damned, as Muhammad your false prophet was, and was slain by them. Not a surprising conclusion to that interreligious dialogue. Then there are the soldiers. The ancient Roman calendar is full of soldier saints. In ancient times, Christianity struggled with the issue of whether believers ought to enlist in or remain in the imperial army. The liturgy answered the question with a paradox. Yes, there were many just men who fought for the emperor, but their righteousness was displayed above all when they refused to worship the emperor's idols and, throwing down their arms, embraced martyrdom for the heavenly king, which is the ultimate act of fortitude or courage. In this way, we see that being a soldier is not in itself incompatible with professing the Christian faith, but also that our ultimate allegiance cannot be to any earthly ruler or his campaigns. As I said, the old liturgical calendar is full of these soldier saints. Just to limit ourselves to the sanctoral cycle in the Roman Missal, St. Sebastian on January 20th, the 40 holy martyrs of the garrison of Sebast on March 10th, St. George, of course, on April 23rd, Saints Nereus and Achilleus on May 12th, Saints Basilides, Serenus Nabor and Nazarius on June 12th, Saints John and Paul, June 26th, Saints Pachesus and Martinian, July 2nd, St. Romanus, August 9th, St. Hippolytus, August 13th, St. Gorgonius, September 9th, St. Eustace and Companions, September 20th, St. Maurice and Companions, September 22nd, St. Theodore, November 9th, St. Martin of Tours, November 11th, and St. Menas, also November 11th. That's over 60 soldiers commemorated at Mass each year. While it is true that these soldiers are celebrated by us at Mass because they are martyrs for the faith, not because they fought for the Roman Empire, they are not condemned for having been in the imperial army, even when it was a pagan army. And subsequent devotion to them has emphasized their military attire, virtues, and patronage, seeing in them models of Christian warfare. The reason I make a point of mentioning Christian soldiers is that the church today has been corrupted by the error of pacifism in various forms. We are not sure anymore if we are allowed to fight about anything. Isn't it mean and nasty to speak against someone's lifestyle choices, their opinions and views, their orientation, or whatever? Isn't it lacking in meekness to resist attacks against our persons or our property? Shouldn't we always turn the other cheek and let God alone defend us? This mentality was already influential during the Second Vatican Council when memories of the horrors of, the, of World War II, together with a secular humanistic optimism about the potential of democratic government and the peacekeeping role of the United Nations, led all too many churchmen into believing that humanity had somehow come of age 
and could now deal with evils not by warring against them or even condemning them, but rather by the gentle touch of negotiation and the warmth of universal benevolence. This attitude, alas, is reflected in certain texts drawn up for the Novus Ordo, which are notable for their naivete and chumminess. And nearly all of the soldier saints I mentioned were removed from Paul VI's calendar in 1969. Catholics have never thought or acted this way until quite recently, this way being a pacifistic way. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, some souls are called to a meekness that is super erogatory, that is above and beyond the call of duty, even as some souls are called to the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience. It would not be edifying to see a Dominican friar wielding an AK-47. Yet Aquinas also notes that the structure of justice inherent to God's creation is not suppressed or contradicted by divine revelation, but rather reinforced by it. This is why at least we, the laity, are allowed to defend ourselves, our families, our communities, our nation, our church, with violence if necessary. One can put it this way. Just as the advent of the more perfect way of the religious life does not cancel out the natural and supernatural goodness of marriage and family, so too the choice of some to allow themselves to be tortured and killed does not cancel out the natural and supernatural goodness of proportionate resistance to evil. While normally our fight against evil will take place in the spiritual domain and in the political arena, there is no reason to exclude the possibility that it may sometimes rightly take place on the physical level, too. Roberto de Mattei has spoken frequently of the danger of what he calls catacombism. Here is how he explains it. Quote, catacombism is the attitude of those who retreat from the battlefield and hide themselves in the illusion of being able to survive without fighting. Catacombism is the denial of the militant conception of Christianity. The catacombist does not wish to fight because he is convinced of having already lost the battle. He accepts the situation of the inferiority of Catholics in the culture as a given, without going back to the causes that have determined it. But if Catholics today are in the minority, it is because they have lost a series of battles. They have lost these battles because they have not fought them. They have not fought them because they have removed the very idea of the enemy, turning their backs on the Augustinian concept of the two cities fighting each other in history, the only concept that can offer us an explanation of what is happening and what has happened. If one rejects this militant concept, one accepts the principle of the irreversibility of the historic process, and from catacombism, one inevitably passes to progressivism and modernism. Wishing to portray that valorous church of ancient times, always ready to live on the forefront as a community of draft dodgers, hiding themselves for embarrassment or cowardice would be an insult to their virtues. They were fully aware of their duty of conquering the world for Christ, of transforming private and public life according to the doctrine and law of the divine Savior, out of which a new civilization could be born. Another Rome springing forth from the tombs of the two princes of the apostles. And they reached their goal. Rome and the Roman Empire became Christian. In times past, it was said that the sacrament of confirmation made us soldiers of Christ. And Pius XII, addressing the bishops of the United States, said, the Christian, if he does honor to the name he bears, is always an apostle. It is not permitted to the soldier of Christ that he quits the battlefield because only death puts an end to his military service. We need to recover this militant conception of the Christian life." Unquote. That was all Roberto de Mattei. A favorite hymn for all the saints, I'm sure it's, it's one of the hymns that's sung every November 1st everywhere, uh, uh, delivers this message loud and clear in one of its verses. Oh, may thy soldiers, faithful, true, and bold, 
Fight as the saints who nobly fought of old, and win with them the victor's crown of gold. And then I won't say the A word. <laughs> More important than the mere presence of saints in the calendar are the prayers we use at Mass for their feasts and commemorations. Among the most important public prayers of the Church are those that we call orations, namely the collects, secrets, and post-communions of the Mass. The collect itself is of special importance because it recurs throughout the divine office as well. If we want to understand how the Catholic Church prays, and therefore what we should believe and how we should live, we must look carefully at some examples of these orations. The prayers of the old missal identify those enemies and adversaries that the church militant must continually encounter in the temporal as well as the spiritual life. Let's have a look at some contrasts. The collect on the optional memorial of St. John of Capistrano, who spurred the Christian army to victory at Belgrade in 1456, goes like this in the Novus Ordo. O God, who raised up St. John of Capistrano to comfort your faithful people in tribulation, place us, we pray, under your safe protection and keep your church in everlasting peace. There's nothing heretical about that prayer. By contrast, here's the prayer found in the traditional missal for the obligatory feast of the same saint. O God, who through blessed John didst enable thy faithful people to triumph over the enemies of the cross by the power of the most holy name of Jesus, grant, we beseech thee, that by his intercession we may overcome the snares of our spiritual enemies and be found worthy to receive from thee the crown of justice. <clears throat> the traditional collect for St. Patrick notes that he brought the gospel not only to the Irish people, as it says in the Novus Ordo prayer, but to the heathens whom we know fiercely resisted him. I suppose uh, in 1969 they didn't want to talk about heathens anymore. The Collect for St. Augustine of Canterbury praises him not only for leading the English peoples to the gospel, as the Novus Ordo says, but also for shedding upon the English people the light of the true faith that is, casting out the darkness of pagan error. For St. Irenaeus of Lyon, the great second century opponent of the heresy of Gnosticism, the Novus Ordo Collect reads, O God, who called the Bishop St. Irenaeus to confirm true doctrine and the peace of the Church, grant, we pray, through his intercession, that being renewed in faith and charity, we may always be intent on fostering unity and concord. The Latin Mass, on the other hand, uses this collect for the saint. O God, who didst vouchsafe unto blessed Irenaeus, thy martyr and bishop, by his strenuous teaching of the truth, utterly to confute heresies, and happily to establish peace in thy church, grant unto us thy people, we beseech thee, to be steadfast in the practice of our holy religion, and in all our days to enjoy that peace which is from thee. The entire tone and much of the content of these prayers is so different. I could point out ten differences in just the Irenaeus ones. Thus, for St. Robert Bellarmine, the old collect pulls no punches. O God, who didst adorn, blessed Robert, thy bishop and doctor, with wondrous learning and virtue, that he might lay bare the snares of error and maintain the rights of the apostolic see, Grant by his merits and intercession that we may grow in love of the truth and that the hearts of the wayward may return to the unity of thy church. In contrast, the new collect for Bellarmine says nothing about the snares of error, maintaining the rights of the apostolic see, love of the truth, or wayward hearts returning to the church. Its Catholic content has been sucked out of it. Michael Fiedrowitz argues, quote, this older version of the Bellarmine prayer does not lessen the charism of the saint, but rather increases it. 
It was precisely his astute refutation of the Protestant errors that made Cardinal Bellarmine the Catholic controversialist most feared by the Protestant reformers, to whose refutation several cathedrae ante Bellarminiane were established. And furthermore, it is only the traditional prayer that speaks of the necessity of a return of heretics to the true religion of the Catholic faith. The classical missal opposes an abandonment of the so-called ecumenism of return, the conviction of the church of all ages that all confessions are in no, in no way equally on the path to truth. The traditional orations recall in an uncomfortable way that in questions of faith, there are not only various opinions, but also errors that must be overcome, or at least fought against. An abandonment of this battle would amount to a victory of relativism." Unquote. One of the votive masses in the back of the Missale Romanum is called the Mass for the Defense of the Church, also known as the Mass Against the Heathen something that would never have been allowed to exist in the Novus Ordo, and in fact does not exist. The collect of this votive mass reads, Almighty everlasting God, in whose hand are the power and the government of every nation, look to the help of the Christian people, that the heathen nations who trust in their own fierceness may be crushed by the power of thy right arm. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The gradual of this Mass prays, O oh my God, make them like a wheel and as stubble before the face of the wind. The Alleluia verse adds, Stir up thy might, O Lord, and come, that thou mayest save us. The secret prays, Look, O Lord, upon the sacrifice which we immolate, that thou wouldst deliver thy champions, pro pugnatores tuos, from all wickedness of the heathen, and keep them secure in thy protection. This virile spirit of the traditional prayer, prayers is found throughout the Missale Romanum, handed down to us by our forefathers. As a more complete illustration, let's take a look at the Mass of July 28th, the feast of the martyrs Nazarius, Celsus, and Pope Victor I, and the confessor Pope Innocent I four saints who were given the axe in 1969, in spite of being called upon by the church at prayer for a good 800 years. The introit is taken from Psalm 78. Let the sighing of the prisoners come in before thee, O Lord. Render to our neighbors sevenfold in their bosom. Revenge the blood of thy saints which hath been shed. O God, the heathens are come into thy inheritance, they have defiled thy holy temple. They have made Jerusalem as a place to keep fruit. Glory be to the Father, and then let the sighing. One of these verses was stigmatized as a cursing verse, and therefore removed entirely from both the post-conciliar lectionary and the Liturgy of the Hours, as were 121 other psalm verses that are nowhere prayed in the Novus Ordo. In general, the more spirited or militant psalms have been minimized or excised, which corresponds to the generally, generally effeminate presentation of Christianity in recent times. Think of the doe-eyed sacred heart images from the 19th and 20th centuries, where our Lord is depicted as a saccharine, fragile, androgynous figure, as if he would flinch at a passing softball or deflate when poked with a needle. I have a real problem with some religious art from recent times. I think it's, we need to have better, better religious art, really high quality art. The collect of the Mass of July 28th is muscular. May the confession of thy saints Nazarius, Chelsus, Victor, and Innocent fortify us, O Lord, and may it graciously win for us reinforcement in our weakness. The lesson is from the Book of Wisdom, chapter 10. God rendered to the just the wages of their labors and conducted them in a wonderful way, and he was to them for a covert by day and for the light of stars by night, and he brought them through the Red Sea and carried them over through a great water, but their enemies he drowned in the sea. Therefore the just took the spoils of the wicked, 
And they sang to thy holy name, O Lord, and they praised with one accord thy victorious hand, O Lord, our God. The gradual and alleluia verses are taken from the book of Exodus. God is glorious in his saints, wonderful in majesty, doing wonders. Thy right hand, O Lord, is glorified in strength. Thy right hand hath broken the enemies. The bodies of thy saints are buried in peace, and their name liveth unto generation and generation. The Gospel of July 28th is taken from St. Luke, chapter 21. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, When you shall hear of wars and seditions, be not terrified. These things must first come to pass, but the end is not yet presently. Then he said to them, Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be great earthquakes in diverse places and pestilences and famines and terrors from heaven, and there shall be great signs. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, dragging you before kings and governors for my name's sake, and it shall happen unto you for a testimony." And you shall be betrayed by your parents and brethren and kinsmen and friends, and some of you they will put to death. And you shall be hated by all men for my name's sake, but a hair of your head shall not perish. In your patience you shall possess your souls. Let us pause for a moment on this potent gospel, so utterly relevant to our postmodern, post Christian age of intensifying persecution. It is a gospel read four times each year in the traditional Latin Mass, unless one of those dates happens to fall on a Sunday. On June 2nd, it's read on June 2nd for Saints Marcellinus, Peter, and Erasmus. On July 28th, as we, as we just saw. On September 16th for Saints Cornelius, Cyprian, Euphemia, Lucy, and Geminian. And on January 22nd for Saints Vincent and Anastasius. In the post-conciliar lectionary, this gospel is read on the 33rd Sunday of Ordinary Time every third year, and part of it is read on Wednesday of the 34th week. I leave you to draw your own conclusions. This proper Mass for July 28th, and it is only one of so many that we could choose from the Church's year, has a spiritedness, a realism, a strength of character in it, massive and fortified as a Romanesque church, tall and straight as a Gothic column, orderly and graceful as a Renaissance facade, well-worn and rugged as a pilgrimage route, with a note of subdued triumph as of soldiers assured of victory but prepared for hardship. We encounter in the traditional liturgy what we heard De Matei calling the militant conception of Christianity. We are engaged in battle against our spiritual enemies, the seething world of unbelief, the flesh or disordered concupiscence, the devil and his minions. The old liturgy does not run away from this reality, but confronts it head on. As the mainstream church slides further into self-referential effeminacy and comfort-seeking compromises with the world, does it not become ever more apparent that what we need to hear and once again strive to live is the truth embedded in the great ancient rite of the Church of Rome. It's highly appropriate to recall at the start of Lent the classic saying that we battle against three enemies. The visible enemy around us, the world, meaning fallen humanity, insofar as it has turned against God by sin. The enemy within us, the flesh, we call it, which refers to the ravages of sin in our nature, and the invisible enemy above us in stature, namely the devil and his fallen angels. Against these enemies, we have the help of the saints of the church triumphant, among whom stand the mighty armies of holy angels. Let me share with you a story from the Desert Fathers. This is one of my favorite of all stories. Quote, While still a neophyte in monastic life, Moses the Black was warring against carnal desire, So he went in a state of turbulence to confess to Abba Isidoros. The elder listened to him sympathetically and, when he had given him words of appropriate counsel, told him to return to his cell. However, 
Inasmuch as Abba Moses was still hesitant for fear of the flames of evil desires rekindling during his return, Abba Isidoros took him by the hand and led him to a small roof atop his cell. Look here, he told him, directing him towards the west. Thereupon Moses saw an entire army of wicked spirits with drawn bows ready for warfare and was terrified. Look now towards the east, the elder told him once more. Myriads of angels in military formation were standing ready to confront the enemy. All of these, Abba Isidoros told him, are assigned by God to help the struggler. Do you see how our defenders are many more and incomparably stronger than our enemies? Moses thanked God with his heart for this revelation and taking courage, returned to his cell to continue his struggle." Unquote. It is not difficult to see that the angels are much, are, are much more frequently acknowledged in the traditional mass and sacramental rites. The prayer at the end of the Asperges asks the Lord to vouchsafe to send thy holy angel from heaven to guard, cherish, protect, visit, and defend all that are assembled in this place. The centuries-old version of the Confiteor expressly calls twice upon St. Michael the Archangel, Prince of the Heavenly Host, and the wearer of souls at the Divine Judgment, and does so three times each Mass, since the Confiteor is said three times. St. Michael is also called upon during the offertory incensation of the gifts at High Mass or in the Leonine prayers at the end of Low Mass. That means he will be invoked a total of seven times each Mass. Shortly after the consecration, the priest whispers this mysterious prayer. Most humbly we implore thee, Almighty God, bid these offerings to be brought by the hands of thy holy angel to thine altar on high before the face of thy divine majesty. The traditional calendar generously makes room for five feasts in honor of the angels. St. Michael on September 29th and again on May 8th, St. Gabriel on March 24th, St. Raphael on October 24th, and the guardian angels on October 2nd. The Novus Ordo collapsed all these feasts into only two, namely September 29th and October 2nd and abolished nearly all of the mentions of the angels in the Mass. That was a mistake. It's rather obvious that in this period of ever-heightening spiritual warfare, we need to cultivate a strong devotion to the angels, and the traditional liturgy helps us to do exactly that. What is our help against the waywardness of the flesh? The answer is more complex because human nature is complicated. We can boil it down to a via negativa and a via positiva, or a way of negation and a way of affirmation. The way of affirmation is the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, in which we give ourselves worthwhile activities, involving alike the body and the soul, done for love of God and neighbor. In other words, we keep busy with good things. The way of negation, on the other hand, is to embrace asceticism, mortification, and penance. This was the original meaning and spirit of the season of Lent, which has now almost entirely disappeared from the consciousness of Catholics, and that's no exaggeration. Now, no one really wants to hear that we need to remove pleasure or add suffering to our lives. This is not a popular message in any time. But the Church understands that we must do so. As even the pagan philosophers Plato and Aristotle saw, Human beings are prone to excess in their appetites, and they need to bend the stick in the opposite direction by choosing to deny themselves legitimate goods in order to gain self-mastery and grow in strength for endurance. Beyond that, we are sinners in need of repentance, and we have debts of punishment to pay. Moreover, because of the solidarity of the mystical body, we can make reparation for the sins of others, which is pleasing to the Lord and meritorious for eternal life. The traditional Mass itself places ascetical demands on us. 
The faithful are typically kneeling for long stretches, from the prayers at the foot of the altar to the gospel, and from the sanctus to the last gospel. This demanding discipline keeps us mindful that we are in a special sacred place, taking part in a sacrifice to which we must unite ourselves, giving a small sacrifice of our own. And with the way pews are in some churches, it's not such a small sacrifice. <laughs> At a high mass, there will be a combination of standing, genuflecting, kneeling, and sitting, which together with the signs of the cross, the beating of the breast, the bowing of the head, and the chanting of responses, immerses us in a total physical and spiritual act of worship so that the faith can enter into our bones, our muscles, our knees, our hands, as well as our ears, eyes, and noses. Catholic worship is physical through and through. Tragically, the Novus Ordo dropped a lot of these muscular and sensuous elements in favor of verbal comprehension and response, which by themselves constitute a fairly impoverished form of participation in one ear and out the other. If the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, then our effort must be to strengthen the flesh to support the spirit. This is perhaps the greatest gap or oversight in modern Christianity, which has become altogether too spiritualized, too abstract, conceptual, in the head. If we want to be soldiers for Christ, we should be thinking as much of an army boot camp as we do of getting more education. Obviously, asceticism and learning belong together, and we need both. But our knowledge will benefit us the most when we confirm it and support it with a regimen of prudent physical asceticism. There is a lot we can start doing immediately, instead of putting it off for a future month or year when we are more holy. We will not become more holy until we embrace discipline. So, for example, I mentioned fasting and abstinence. A fast is traditionally understood to be not eating until the evening of the day when we take one meal. That's, for example, what traditional monks will do, one meal a day in the evening. However, for those who are not ready to try that, or those whose close relatives will not allow them to try it, an effective and more manageable fast is to refrain from eating until noon and then to eat nothing after 8 p.m. The 16 hours of not eating between 8 p.m. and 12 p.m. will still be penitential, but you will probably not be as much of a burden to the people around you. And in any case, you'll be asleep for half of the time. <laughs> it is a good middle option for the season of Lent, for ember and regation days, and for vigils of great feasts. As those who fast regularly have experienced, after initial difficulties, we arrive at a better place, where we are not so dependent on our bodily urges and acquire better mental clarity and spiritual alertness, and usually sleep better and require less sleep. I have noticed that young people struggle a lot with going to bed on time and getting up at a reasonable hour. I used to struggle with this challenge myself. In fact, if I were being honest, I would say I still struggle with it sometimes. If we, do not pray, if we do not pray first thing in the morning, our day will never go well, or at least not as well as it could have gone, should have gone. A major form of asceticism for the young is forcing themselves to go to bed at an hour that makes possible a consistent early rising for a morning prayer routine, which might, for example, take the form of reciting the office of prime and spending 15 minutes in quiet prayer with or without a Bible. St. Alphonsus Liguori famously said, he who prays is saved, he who does not pray is lost. If we want to pray, we need to get up. If we want to get up, we need to go to bed. If we want to be strong and not sluggish, we should adopt some fasting and abstinence. This advice is common to all of the saints who talk about the spiritual life. I'm not saying anything that hasn't already been known for over 1,700 years, ever since Christians first started heading out into the Egyptian desert to learn the secrets of sanctity. A last thought about mortification. Not everyone can do everything recommended by the saints, and some people are in a situation where they cannot handle any more challenges than life has already given them. 
For example, a mother with a nursing baby should not even dream about fasting. What God is asking of us is to take whatever steps we can, when and as we can, to pray more, to deny ourselves in little ways, and to order our lives more fully to the Lord who deserves all our love. The traditional liturgy gives us tools for this lifelong work because its calendar, prayers, and customs continually remind us of the spirit of detachment and self-abnegation preached and practiced by Christ our King and his servants, always for the sake of more perfect love. As a Benedictine oblate, I pray the little hours of the divine office throughout the week. The one portion I always pray, come what may, is the office of prime. You've heard me mention this a few times which is the shorter of the two morning hours and which has been dubbed the office of fighters and workers. In the monastic use, Psalm 17 is divided between Friday and Saturday mornings. This psalm is one of the most vigorous expressions in the Bible of the militant spirituality of the sons of God living in a land of exile and tribulation. I would like to quote some verses from it to show how profoundly this message permeates the revealed word of God. In the Psalter, God is teaching us what to pray for and how to pray for it. We must take him at his word. We must make his words our own, week after week. The title of Psalm 17 is, and that's the old psalm, the Vulgate psalm numbering, The title of the psalm is, Unto the End, for David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this canticle, in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hands of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. King David begins, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my firmament, my refuge, and my deliverer. My God is my helper, and in him will I put my trust my protector and the horn of my salvation and my support. Then come the words spoken at every traditional mass by the priest as he takes up the chalice, ready to drink the precious blood of his Lord and God. Laudans invocabo dominum et ab inimicis mei salvus ero. Praising, I will call upon the Lord and I shall be saved from my enemies. Skipping some verses, we come back to our theme. He delivered me from my strongest enemies and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. For who is God but the Lord? Or who is God but our God? God who hath girt me with strength and made my way blameless, who hath made my feet like the feet of hearts, and who setteth me upon high places, who traineth my hands to battle, and thou hast made my arms like a brazen bow. And thou hast given me the protection of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath held me up. And thy discipline hath corrected me unto the end, and thy discipline the same shall teach me. I will pursue after my enemies and overtake them, and I will not turn again till they are consumed. I will break them, and they shall not be able to stand. They shall fall under my feet. And thou hast girded me with strength unto battle, and hast subdued under me them that rose up against me. And thou hast made my enemies turn their back upon me, and hast destroyed them that that hated me. And I shall beat them as small as the dust before the wind. I shall bring them to naught like the dirt in the streets. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my God, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. O God, who avengest me and subduest the peoples under me, my deliverer from my enemies. And thou wilt lift me up, Above them that rise up against me, from the unjust man thou wilt deliver me. Therefore will I give glory to thee, O Lord, among the nations, and I will sing a psalm to thy name, giving great deliverance to his king and showing mercy to David, his anointed, and to his seed forever. The enemies against whom we are praying in this psalm are not, let's say, the people we happen to dislike or despise. The enemies are, first and foremost, our own evil passions and vicious habits, since we carry around inside us a certain degree of enmity with God. The primary battlefield of Psalm Psalm 17 is our own soul. 
Second, these enemies are the demons who truly hate God and hate us, and who therefore seek our ruination. Against them, we are to wage an implacable war, never showing mercy. We don't have to be worried about speaking in such negative terms about the demons. Third, the enemies of Psalm 17 are the sworn human adversaries of the church, not insofar as they are persons, but insofar as they are adversaries, such as communists, Freemasons, BLM, Planned Parenthood, and sad to say, many bishops in the episcopacy. What's more, the I in this psalm, the one who is saying, I will break them, I shall beat them, I shall bring them to naught, is Christ our King, the head of the church, for he alone has the authority to speak this way and to use us as his instruments. It's, it's obvious from the poem that it's the king who is speaking. So when we put these words on our lips, we're asking to be joined to him and in his battle and in his victory. If we want him to be the one who fights in us and through us so that we may share his triumph, we must remain united to him in faith, strong in hope, ardent in charity as living members of his body. Only he can successfully defeat our enemies within and without and he will defeat them for those who stay close to him. He will defeat them for his bride, the church, immaculate in her heavenly glory. We have every reason to be confident and not to lose heart. For was it not our blessed Lord and King who said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. John chapter 10. In the traditional Latin Mass, God is called omnipotent 16 times. He is almighty, having power to do all things, and he is at work in you and in me. Deus pater omnipotens. That is why St. Paul can exclaim to the Ephesians, Now to him who is able to do all things more abundantly than we desire or understand, according to the power that worketh in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus unto all generations, world without end. Amen. Thank you for your kind attention. So that if, I could, if I could rephrase the question, maybe we could say something like this. If we recognize that we have such riches or such a treasure in the tradition of the church, the liturgical tradition of the church, um, as I've tried to illustrate, and the, kind of, and the thing I illustrated in my talk today with regard to the theme of, of Christian militancy is something that, that I could do and I have done with many other themes as well. There are many areas in which there are much greater riches in the old missal. Um, and, uh, and so then the question is, how do we bring those riches to the wider church? Um, well, you know, sadly, uh, Pope, Pope Francis has put an end temporarily, or at least is trying to put an end, to the efforts started by Pope Benedict XVI to do precisely that, which was to bring the riches of the church to a wider and wider 
uh, number of our fellow Catholics. Um, but I don't think that the current effort or campaign to reduce and diminish the role of the traditional liturgy is actually going to succeed. So concretely speaking, I mean, I do think we need to, to invite uh, our friends and family from time to time, if there's somebody who's open to uh, an adventure, to a new thing, uh, to come to a solemn mass, to experience it, uh, to come to, if you have an opportunity for Vespers somewhere, I'm sure that there must be places that do sung Vespers, um, to introduce people to the beauty of ritual, the beauty of chant. Um, some people might be reached through intellectual argument if, they're, if, if they like to read books. Maybe you could find a good book for them um, or a video presentation. Um, there are people, of course, who are stubbornly opposed and resistant to anything traditional. Uh, and for those people, they, maybe they can be your intention for your fasting uh, during, during Lent. Uh, since, uh, yeah. what, what makes you think that the Pope will not be successful in suppressing the Latin Mass? Um, so quite frankly, the movement... In that the movement of laity and clergy and some religious as well, uh, in favor of, in love with, full of zeal for uh, Catholic tradition, is simply too big right now. There, there are clergy everywhere in the world. I've met them. I've gone all over the place. Uh, and they are committed as can be. Whatever it takes, uh, even if they have to keep something going secretly, they will do it. Uh, the laity, I mean, I don't know about you, but, but as, as a layman... Um, you know, what, what came down in July and what came down in December just infuriated me and made me want to fight all the more harder and, do all, and work all the harder uh, for tradition. And I know bishops, I, I'm friends with a number of bishops and a couple of cardinals who have also told me privately they're not going to follow these things either. So it's, you know, the, the, the horse is out of the barn. It's too late right now. If tradition couldn't be crushed in the 1970s, when there were far fewer Catholics fighting for it, and when there was a stronger sense of ultramontanism, or you have to do what the Pope says, it's certainly not going to succeed in the 2020s. So I just think, I think it's almost as simple as demographics. Um, where is the real passion in the church? Where are the families? You know, uh, you just look around and, and, that's, and you, you can see the answer. Oh, I see. I have, a, I have some questions here. Let me... It's, um, so here's a question. Uh, there have been significant changes to the divine office, even from the 1900s onwards, after Divino of Flatu. Which version of the office would you recommend praying, especially considering the reordering of the Psalms in the breviary? Okay, so a little bit of this is inside baseball, but I can, I can put it like this. Um, the Roman church had what you might call a, a breviary of the ages, just like she has a mass of the ages, uh, obviously developed to some extent over time, but the core of it was always present. Um, because of some, very, some great, almost intractable problems, Pius X decided to reorder the Psalter in, uh, in early in the 20th century, 1911. But it remained in Latin, it remained the Vulgate Psalter, and all 150 psalms in their completeness were prayed each week at least in, in many weeks of the year. So no verses were omitted because they were politically incorrect or something like that. So if you use the Roman breviary of Pius X, although it's not the order of the ancient Roman breviary, it's still the Psalter of David. It's still God's inspired word as he gave it to us in the Psalms. Uh, and it still has the chapters and the verses and the responsories and the other things that the divine office should have. So if you have a Roman breviary, an old Roman breviary, by all means use that, if that's what you're comfortable with, if that's what you've become accustomed to. Um, for myself, as I mentioned, I'm a Benedictine oblate, and I love the monastic divine office um, because the monastic divine office is essentially unchanged since about the 6th century. It's very, very ancient, um, and it, it, uh, it has that old psalm sequence that monks and nuns have been praying for all this time. Uh, it's, and I find it just a really marvelous, marvelous um, um, book of prayer. Uh, the Anglican Ordinariate has produced a really excellent um, divine office of their own. If, you're, if you wish to pray in, let's say, elevated English, an, an English with an elevated tone, a poetic tone, 
and again, all the Psalms, with, not with 121 verses cut out of them, then the Anglican divine office would also be an option. Uh, the Anglican ordinariate divine office would be an option for you as well. Yeah. I do really encourage Catholics to get to know the divine office better. It's the other great liturgy of the church. We have the liturgy of the, of the holy sacrifice of the mass, and we have the liturgy of the divine office. Uh, and these two are really meant to be complementary, and in the traditional forms, they're very tightly in- interconnected in a way that's not true with the Novus Ordo and the Liturgy of the, Hour, of the, the Liturgy of the Hours. All right, let's have a look at another question. Um, oh, this is, an, this is a fun one. I've, I've not yet read any of your books. Which is the best one with which to start? Uh, <laughs> um, and actually, there's another one, too, like that. Um, well, it, 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 I have several books that are sp- about the traditional Latin liturgy and different aspects of it. Um, o- often what I do is I, I, I kind of, like I did in today's talk, I approach it from a certain angle. And this was Christian militancy, that theme. Um, and so I approach the liturgy from different angles. And when I have enough angles that, that seem to hang together, then I publish it as a book. So that's why I have several books about the traditional Latin Mass. Um, the one that's called Reclaiming Our Roman Catholic Birthright is sort of like an apologetics manual. It gives arguments in favor of, in defense of the traditional Latin Mass, why, of its peculiarities, you might say, and also responds to objections that people bring against it. Um, that one, I only have a few copies left, so you might not actually be able to, to pick one of those up today. Um, then I have, I have a few books about other topics. I would, if you're interested in this question of the roles of the laity and the clergy in the church, which have become so confused and so convoluted, in recent times, uh, and then especially the question of men and women in the church and the, 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 the influence of feminism, which has been driving um, you know, women deacons and, and the, the, the female altar servers and all this, all this uh, business. Um, I, I have a new book out called Ministers of Christ that goes into, that, that explains why the Catholic Church traditionally reserved all liturgical ministries to men, why, why we should still do that, and why we should have the minor orders as well, right? Um, porter, exorcist, lector, and acolyte. It goes into all of that. So if you're, if you're interested in diving deeper into the way that the old liturgy works, that might be something, uh, and, and how it intersects with current cultural um, controversies, that might be a good one, a good choice for you as well. It's called Ministers of Christ. Yeah. Just, just came out uh, a few months ago. Um, then another person is asking what websites are best to find articles along the lines of what was said today. Um, definitely, uh, I would recommend New Liturgical Movement, at least for those of you who are really quite specifically interested in the liturgy itself. That, has, that website has beautiful material on it. Um, it's very informative and very heartening as well. Just to go back to an earlier question, you know, practically every week at New Liturgical Movement, there are photographs of a solemn liturgy that took place in this city or that city or this place or that place or a new Latin mass here that never existed before. When you, when you look at that, that kind of news regularly, you realize, oh yeah, this is like fire. It's just going, right? It's, uh, you're not going to be able to quench that. Um, okay. Also, Rerate Celi, um, sometimes it gets a, a bit of a bad rap, but I think it doesn't deserve it. I, I think Rerate Celi is a blog that is very informative uh, about church news and reactions to church news, in, you know, informative um, pieces there as well, Rorate Celi. 1 Peter 5, I would also recommend. I think it has good material about all sorts of topics, traditional Catholic topics, not just the liturgy. So you might mention to them the Le Baru, uh, chants at Le Baru, you could listen to the whole divine office. Oh, the yes. That's, That's a good point. point. So Father is reminding me here that Le Baru, uh, it's a monastery, a Benedictine monastery in France, spelled B-A-R-R-O-U-X. Uh, they actually put their divine office chanted online. I think they might live stream it. Maybe you can also click on it after, afterwards because, of course, they're in a totally different time zone, you know, six or seven, six hours. There are two websites. The, yeah. the live stream is on the monastery website. Right. But if you do chants of the okay. then they archive them and you can okay. go back. Okay. So yeah, so you can either find the live stream or the archives, which is good if you, if, you're, if you want to hear them singing the office and follow it that way. 
This is a similar kind of question. Um, uh, uh, can I recommend a source that compares, that does comparisons between the TLM and the Novus Ordo? Um, and, you know, a resource to give to priests to convince them of the need for the TLM. Um, there, I think, if you're, if you're talking about a priest who is open-minded, who actually wants to learn more about the liturgy, doesn't have any kind of ideological uh, ax to grind, then a, a really fine book that I recommend to everybody universally is, is called, it's just called The Traditional Mass. The subtitle is the History, Form, and Theology of the Classical Roman Rite. It's by a German named Michael Fiedrowitz, F-I-E-D-R-O-W-I-C-Z, but you'll find it on Amazon uh, easily. And it's, it's quite simply the best one-volume work about the traditional Latin Mass that I've ever read. It's, it's just beautiful. It gives you... Um, it gives, it's so insightful. And he, he's not doing a lot of comparison with the Novus Ordo, He's mostly just talking about why the Latin Mass, you know, how it developed historically and why it is the way it is and what's the benefit of Latin, what's the benefit of the Gregorian chant, these sorts of things. But there's enough comparison in it that it actually does serve that purpose as well. It's also not a polemical book, uh, unlike some of my material, which tends to be rather polemical. Um, so if, if you're, if, you know, that, that would just be another book I could recommend. Uh, let's see. Regarding the weakening of our militancy, do you see further evidence of this in the revision of the rite of exorcism? And how great is the difference between the old and new exorcism rites? That's a great question. The new rite of exorcism is, uh, is, is really a hack job, like so many other things. Um, it, it's, it, it, it guts the traditional rite of exorcism of a lot of its, of its virility, a lot of the strength of those old prayers. Um, and as far as I can tell, it seems to have been designed by rationalists who haven't actually done battle with demons the way that exorcists have using the old prayers. I do know that some exorcists have gone on record saying that they've tried the new rite of exorcism and it doesn't work, uh, or it doesn't work as well, uh, and that they've gone back to using the old rite. Um, also, it's quite common to hear exorcists say that Latin is much more effective in exorcism than, than any other language. Uh, this is not superstition. These are not urban legends. These are facts. Um, but I haven't studied, I haven't done a comparison looking for the language of battle and militancy, so I don't know, I couldn't really answer specifically if that aspect is so different. I just know that it's watered down uh, like so many other things uh, have been watered down. Um, what I would comment here, I would comment here on the terrible difference between the old and new rites of baptism. Um, you know, I was baptized with the new rite. Uh, probably most of you were baptized in the new rite, and we are baptized, and thanks be to God for that. So I'm, not, I'm not talking about its validity. But as a ritual, as a liturgical rite, the old rite of baptism is much more ancient. It, it, it contains uh, a large segment of exorcism prayers, um, you know, it contains more blessings of the individual being baptized. Uh, it includes the blessing of salt and the placing of salt in the mouth of the one being baptized, which is actually, a, it's a sacramental that is meant to prepare the tongue for receiving the body of Christ on the tongue in the Eucharist. So, um, so just as the priest's hands are consecrated to handle the Eucharist, our tongue is, is blessed in order to receive on the tongue. So there's so much in the old rite of baptism that uh, um, really, I think, I think it's just a, um, it's a, it's a shock and a scandal what was done to the rite of baptism. Uh, and so if you have uh, any of you uh, in a position to baptize your children, make sure they get baptized in the traditional Roman rite. Uh, I did that with, with my own children, and I was just so awed and impressed by, by those rites. Anyway, yeah. I think that's all I have uh, for now. So... We can, I think we can, we can end, and I will go back out uh, to the table, and I'd be happy to meet any of you afterwards. Thank you.